Um, <clears throat> okay, great. Well, it's uh, great to be here. That's very interesting. <laughs> I have to apologize that this uh, system that I'll be talking about is not an open system, although there are some interesting questions that could be asked about, about uh, opening it up and allowing participation. Um, it's work that just appeared, and it's a collaboration with Glass, who I've worked with over the last few years on these kind of topics quite extensively. Uh, but the nice thing about this, from the point of view of giving a talk, is that most, m most of the physics can be understood in a purely graphical way, uh, and in particular this notion of space-time duality, which I'll explain, uh, can, be, uh, can be seen very easily. So um, I'm interested in many-body dynamics and discrete space and discrete time, so the sort of thing that might be appropriate for a quantum circuit or quantum computation. And we've got a system of uh, Q-dits, so um, Q-dimensional uh, local uh, local Hilbert space Q degrees of freedom uh, with Q equals two corresponding to Q bits. Uh, and I'm going to introduce the model in a sort of abstract statistical mechanical way and then we'll see what properties of local evolution or quantum circuits or this kind of thing. Okay, so imagine we have a partition function which has this uh, on, a, on a square lattice for concreteness where uh, between each uh, site or, uh, or, or on every bond we have a factor U sub IJ uh, which is a map from uh, ZQ times ZQ to the phases U1. And we've got two kinds of bonds, vertical and horizontal, uh, and two kinds of functions, uh, UH uh, and UV, which appear on the horizontal and vertical bonds, respectively. And by summing over all uh, these, uh, um, by summing over Q on each of the lattice sites, uh, we have a partition function of some statistical mechanical clock-like <coughs> or Q-state model. Okay, so alternatively, as many people here will be familiar with, you can think of this in terms of a tensor network, uh, where the, uh, these boxes uh, correspond to uh, rank two tensors, these UIJs on each bond, and at each of the vertices we have a rank four uh, delta tensor, which is one when all of the indices coincide and zero otherwise. Okay, and so by uh, you can regard evaluating the partition function as a uh, as the same as evaluating or contracting all the indices in this uh, tensor network. Um, quantum mechanically, we can imagine this as a um, uh, describing the evolution from bottom to top of a set of n uh, qubits, uh, where the values of the uh, these um, variables <laughs> z on each side uh, correspond to uh, the uh, eigenstates in the computational basis. And what we'd like to do is to look at uh, find conditions. Uh, that give rise to the, the, so that the partition function actually describes unitary evolution when we fix the uh, values of the z's to be, uh, to be some, something at the bottom and something at the top, and we want this to be a matrix sum under some unitary operator. And that obviously involves putting some conditions on these uh, um, bond functions u, i, j. So um, if we look at a row in that partition function, um, that corresponds to a diagonal uh, operator uh, where the matrix elements down the diagonal are just phases given by this function u h, and uh, so that's going to be uh, that will be a unitary operator if those are just phases, uh, a diagonal unitary operator, and then if we look at the other part of the partition function, these vertical uh, bonds, uh, we want to require that those two are unitaries. So in other words, each one of those uh, vertical bonds uh, is a single site. Uh, uh, unitary operator on a QDIF. Um, and so if we, um, uh, and furthermore, we've already said that the, <coughs> these things are phases. So since up to normalization, this is a, uh, these UV uh, are um, unitary and they're also uh, just phases that makes some complex Hadamard matrices. Um, and a, a simple example of a complex Hadamard matrix, just a Fourier matrix, a thing which computes the discrete uh, Fourier transform. Uh, in, in, uh, in Q dimensions. So um, you, that's how the, the Hadamard condition arises. So if we, uh, if we then compose many uh, horizontal and uh, vertical uh, bonds together from bottom to top, uh, then if uh, UV is a Hadamard matrix, then this whole thing uh, gives us this partition function, uh, gives us the uh, matrix elements of unitary operators. Now, um, we can also think about evaluating the same tensor network from left to right instead of from bottom to top. And we can ask a question um, 
which, which has turned out to be very fruitful in recent years, uh, what happens if we insist that propagation in the spatial direction, in the left-right direction, is unitary as well? And by this exactly the same argument, uh, we can say that that's going to happen if this function uh, 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 so if, we, if uh, both uv and describing the vertical bonds and uh describing the horizontal bonds <laughs> are Hadamard, uh, then we have a system uh, which has what we'll call space-time duality, namely that we have unitary propagation in the vertical or in the horizontal directions. And so this was exploited a lot in, these, in recent years. I mean, these were the early papers and there's been many more uh, applications since. Um, so, um, you know, that was just, so I introduced this in a completely abstract way by just insisting on the properties of this tensor network. So where, physically speaking, does this kind of thing arise? Uh, one place is in uh, Floquet dynamics, or specifically stroboscopic dynamics. Uh, so we imagine that these, uh, this uh, row uh, unitary and the vertical unitary are the exponentials of two different Hamiltonians. And if we think about the structure of those two unitaries, it's clear that H1, the thing that generates this row, uh, unitary uh, has got to be a sum of diagonal terms, each acting on two neighboring qubits. And so that's sort of an Ising like interaction or a generalized mm -hmm. Ising like interaction. Uh, whereas H2 is going to be a single qubit term, which gives us a tip or creates a quantum superposition in the computational basis. So if we want um, the matrix elements of these things to be uh, just phases, so to give us Hadamards. Uh, then we actually have there's some fine tuning required. So these T1 and T2, these, these locate periods, have to be fine tuned uh, in order to give us this uh, property. Um, but there are examples, quite natural examples. One is a, um, for Q equals two, uh, the self dual Kicks Ising model. And uh, later on, we'll see a Q equals three example, the kind of Kicks Cox model. Um, so the other place where this same structure arises is in brickwork circuit, which have been studied a lot in, in, in recent years, both in quantum computation and in, in many body dynamics. And to just squint at this tensor network and see how it's related to or how a brickwork circuit comes out of it, uh, you just have to identify uh, this uh, object pictured down here as being your elementary gate, where we should now think of these three valent uh, tensors as being uh, rank three delta tensors. Uh, and you can see that this uh, tensor network at the top can actually be decomposed as a, a brickwork circuit. Um, and the condition, you know, the Hadamard condition in this case, tells us that the individual gates are satisfied by uh, property called dual, dual unitarity, namely that they're unitary going from bottom to top or from left to right. So um, this is a comment about boundary conditions. It's not, it's not too important. Um, alternatively, you can uh, sort of slightly less well-known uh, formulation of, of uh, this problem uh, is called the, the, the rounded face uh, form. This was a paper by Tom, Thomas Frozen a few years ago. Uh, and in this case, we, we identify a different uh, unit cell in the network, and we give it a different interpretation as a, a controlled single site uh, unitary. So this is a, a unitary which acts on a single qubit, but which is controlled by the two neighboring qubits. And uh, so these two controlled indices, A and C, uh, control the value of the unitary which acts um, <laughs> from uh, index D to index B. Now, if we insist uh, that that structure can also be interpreted uh, as a unitary propagation in the space flight direction, then that involves uh, switching the roles of the control indices and the uh, index acting on the central site. Uh, and that condition is again met by, by this, uh, applying this Hadamard condition. Okay. So one, one very simple, um, you know, one very simple way of understanding uh, or, 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 under, or getting a handle on the dynamics is in the special case where we take these, these Hadamards to be Fourier matrices. So I already introduced this as an example. And if you do that, and you think, uh, and, and we take this uh, this unit cell that I just identified, and think about summing over the central index here, uh, then just the property of the uh, Fourier matrix tells us uh, that the um, and actually I'm, I'm allowing here that the horizontal ones are, are the conjugate of the Fourier matrix and the vertical ones are the Fourier matrix. Then um, that just gives a constraint on the four indices uh, around this unit cell. Uh, and now I can think of um, the just a, a, one of the sub lattices of this um, of this model, uh, I can think of just introducing a, 
uh, a space-time function s taking values in q uh, and i have a, a very simple update rule which is just pictured at the bottom a simple linear update rule mod q uh, for how that function propagates uh, in time and uh, this is just a kind of very simple linear cellular automata. In fact, it's one of these, uh, it's a reversible version of one of these uh, Wolfram cellular automata's number. Um, okay, so that's an introduction to the model. In the, in the rest of the talk, I'll, you know, there's quite a lot in, in different applications of these models in the paper, but I'll just highlight uh, a few of them. Uh, one is to do with the dynamics of uh, uh, Clifford cat maps, another one to do with entanglement growth, and then the third to do with uh, long range uh, entanglement growth at this time. Okay, so I sort of introduced this in a very general, uh, these models in a very general setting uh, described by general Hadamard matrices. Um, but for the case of QDITs, that's sort of the useful basis uh, comes from considering uh, generalized Pauli matrices. So these are these uh, uh, sometimes called uh, clock and shift uh, matrices uh, Z and X, which is generalization of the usual Pauli's uh, at Q equals two. And uh, they, um, the, the Q uh, powers are, are the identity and they satisfy this additional uh, vial relation at the bottom here where omega is the Q root of unity. Uh, and so they, they are, um, so yeah, so the, eigen, the eigenvectors um, are, I'll denote by lowercase z and X. And uh, think of these as being like the position and momentum or a periodic position of momentum, and this is being the quantum mechanical analog of a toroidal phase space. Um, so to move between X and Z, I can say it's just a question of using the, uh, the uh, Fourier matrix, alternatively conjugating uh, big Z by the Fourier matrix gives us big X, and, uh, vice, uh, and, and, and similarly conjugating by X gives us Z to the minus one. So a natural basis then for operators is, the, uh, is just the products of uh, Pauli's uh, z and x to the power of the arbitrary power. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we can actually think about then the dynamics of uh, arbitrary operators just by thinking about the, uh, how our gates apply to these uh, single site, uh, uh, this basis of single site operators. For example, conjugating by the Fourier matrix uh, takes uh, power, z to the power of a, x to the power of b, x to the power of a z to the power of minus b and that has a simple semi-classical interpretation in terms of phase space it just corresponds to pi over two uh, rotation of phase space okay so then in, in that way we can build up some uh, a, pic a picture of uh of, of how uh, unitaries act on these uh, on these basis states so for example a power of z uh corresponds to a kind of kick to the momentum x by, by an amount minus k where k is power of z. Um, if I apply this uh, diagonal matrix of phases with, with a quadratic um, function in the exponent, uh, then I get a kind of uh, linear kick to the momentum on the side, which is linear in the position variable z, uh, and with a, with a coefficient alpha, which is, uh, um, uh, which is power of s, which is applied. And this corresponds, you know, in, a, in a classical analog, in the classical phase space, this corresponds to a, a shear uh, of the torus uh, and has a simple classical interpretation. If I apply some, some phase function e to the i theta, that, that corresponds semi-classically to shifting the momentum by, by the gradient of theta. Um, so, Yes, that's right. Yeah, strictly, yeah, strictly speaking, that would just apply for Q. Yeah, so, so we'd expect in the large Q limit to recover <laughs> the classical phase space um, and, and a classical map. Okay, so if we combine S with the Fourier matrix and we can get this family of, uh, of, of Hadamard's parameterized by alpha and delta, and uh, this has the effect on one of the operator basis states, which is given here, uh, just uh, is written in terms of this, this uh, linear transformation T, uh, which involves these parameters alpha and delta. And this is a subfamily of um, the linear area preserving maps on the core. So with, with two parameters. Uh, the, the general case um, of, of, a, uh, of a, just a linear preserving map on the torus has got four parameters, uh, well, three parameters, because alpha, beta, gamma, delta with this restraint, with this constriction, um, the case beta equals zero, which we just saw, sorry, beta, 
linked up beta equals one in code. The case beta equals one that we just saw, uh, in fact, in the quantum in the quantum problem corresponds to flippants. In other words, the if we when we act on any one of these uh, um, uh, uh, basis states here, we get we get another one without any superposition. Um, this is just a parenthetical comment. You can perturb this map um, by this uh, sign term, which is still Hadamard, um, and uh, is Clifford still for beta equals one, but for, um, uh, sorry, for, for kappa equals zero, but for non-zero kappa, it is non-zero. Non okay, so if, if we now consider the, the N, um, Qubit system, then we can consider the propagation of a basis state, which is given by uh, an index uh, uh, or an index A and B on, on each of the sites, and then by uh, conjugating uh, by um, by the appropriate unitary, we can see how these uh, these indices evolve in time. So if we now, if we now have consider Fourier uh, matrices in the horizontal direction and one of these cat maps uh, in the vertical direction, uh, then we get this. A uh, very simple set of equations of motion for the A and B indices, which is a kind of discrete um, uh, PDE, if you like, in space time. Uh, and you can think of this, this first formulation here as being like a Hamiltonian form, which involves both the A and the B <laughs> variables, or alternatively, you can eliminate the A variables and just get this Lagrangian form here, which involves this um, uh, space time uh, Laplacian. Um, and, uh, and also these parameters alpha and delta, which are here. Um, if, if alternatively the, you, you take uh, F dagger in the horizontal direction, you get a little D'Alembertian instead of these two things here. Okay, so this is an example of what's called a Clifford semi automata, or sometimes in the classical limit, it's, it was uh, christened a coupled cap map a few years ago, uh, and, uh, and these things were all rather closely related uh, to the dual unitary circuits. And they all have to share this property of space time duality. One thing that I'll sort of highlight very quickly uh, is this is the distinction between the case alpha plus delta uh, non zero and alpha plus delta equal to zero. So when alpha plus delta is non zero, zero, the operator dynamics is fractal. Because the dynamics is linear, you just have to consider what happens to one x or one z operator. Um, but for alpha plus delta non zero, um, essentially just by Fourier analysis, you can. Uh, show that depending on the, the, the trace of the matrix which propagates the Fourier components, uh, you either get uh, glider dynamics or this uh, fractal dynamics. The proof actually appeared uh, some time ago, but I'll just flash some pictures of what happens in the Ising model uh, at the self dual point if you just see it with an, uh, an initial uh, Z operator or in with slightly more color, well, actually, it's a gray scale, but uh, for the Q equals three case, uh, this, is, this is what happens. So the, the fractal dynamics is. Is, is uh, generic when alpha plus delta is non-zero. Uh, and then when alpha plus delta is equal to zero, and I'm, I'm illustrating this for the simple case where they're, where they're both zero, uh, you get uh, what's called glider dynamics, which is to say that the, um, the operators, operators propagate simply to the left or right without actually spreading. <coughs> so you can take these uh, equations in that case and just show that they have simple right and left moving so these are the simplest propagating solutions where you have a Z and X onto neighboring sites, uh, and their powers are also right and left propagating solutions. And so that gives us a set of uh, two sets of Q independent gliders per site, and therefore a complete basis, which shows that the whole system has a recurrent sign which is linear in the system size as things just propagate around the system. In the case of periodic boundary. Um, one, one sort of interesting feature of these systems is also that they have these, you know, set of uh, vacuum states in, in quotes, which is to say, uh, when uh, um, uh, when we have a, 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 a constant uh, family of constant operators, or and if we interpolate between two vacuum states, then we get a sort of propagating domain wall either to the left or to the right. Uh, and the glider solutions that I just identified are in, in fact uh, uh, products or bilinears in these propagating solutions. 
And in fact, these, these propagating solutions are uh, GQ Clara fermion, uh, which generalize the uh, Jordan Bigner fermions with Q equals two. Okay, so that's the that, that was operator dynamics. Um, entanglement growth has been, um, you know, in, in, in general, in a circuit, is hard to compute, but uh, it, we, we've known for some time that this additional space time duality allows. Uh, uh, allows statements about entanglement to be made more precisely, and in particular, tends to uh, we tend to have maximal entanglement growth in this situation. Uh, and these these circuits are particularly nice for understanding why that happens just at the level of uh, the wave function. Um, so to, to see how that goes, imagine starting from uh, an eigenstate. Sorry, fine. so imagine starting from an eigenstate which is alternating in uh, in z and x eigenstates, um, which is this graphical representation here. Uh, and then applying um, uh, a circuit where you have the, both the horizontal and vertical bonds described by this uh, Fourier matrix. Uh, and that um, uh, has the graphical uh, representation down the bottom here. And you can see what, what's happened is that the, um, the, the uh, X and Z have different places, and we have updated the indices according to this rule, 150 cellular automata rule. And if we apply it a second time, then we recover the original pattern of ZX, ZX basis state we had at the beginning. Uh, and so you've mapped a product state to a product state and no entanglement has been uh, generated. So, um, so very simple to understand, but also not very interesting. Um, but we, all, we, we know already, or we have known for some time, that if you start with one of these circuits from, from uh, all Z product state or an all X product state, uh, then you get maximum entanglement growth. And um, what that means concretely is if we have a, a bipartition of a semi-implement system, uh, then the Renier entanglement entropies grow at a rate uh, log Q per time step. And so it's easy to actually understand why this is happening on the basis of this, this simple propagation of uh, product states. So we take a, a, an all Z uh, product state, and we expand every other site in terms of the X basis. And the advantage of doing that is that we know that these states on the right-hand side, each one of those in the sum, actually propagates in a simple way and remains a product state, uh, but it obeys this rule 150 cellular automata dynamics. And so what happens is that each of the indices that you're summing over, these X2, X4, and so on, under that dynamics, then begins to appear in a, in a light cone of the, uh, in, um, of the index in which it started. And so that means uh, that when we think about the entanglement between two regions, um, we have uh, the sum over that index is actually generating ent entanglement between a, uh, a region which is intersecting with a light cone. And that gives us, in fact, this maximal uh, entanglement. If you the slight curiosity is that if you allow for a more general, uh, general um, initial state parameterized by some coefficient cx, then you can actually tune the entanglement velocity from zero to its maximal value, uh, which is somewhat surprising in light of this, this result at the bottom here, which claims maximal entanglement growth um, for almost all Julian entry circuits. But to, <laughs> the key word is almost all. This is obviously a particularly fine tuned uh, exception, which allows you to dial up any entanglement growth you like. Okay, good. Um, what? Maxima is probably out of trouble. Right. Okay, I, I'll just flash it very quickly. So there, there was a, a, a paper a couple of years ago which showed that this model here with uh, this Q equals three model with floquet dynamics <laughs> has some other interesting behavior. And um, the, the, the point that, that I want to make here is that this, this model um, is actually an example of these models we're considering with just a particular structure that the vertical and horizontal bonds have uh, described by complex Hadamard matrices, which are inverse to each other. And um, the, the particular, you know, particular feature that was discussed in that paper was, uh, was that under a particular protocol, it was possible to generate a, uh, a rainbow state of kind of nested L pairs. Mm -hmm. So uh, this state, uh, this state here. And uh, without, without going into the, all of the details we're just showing you the picture, the way in which the way in which this happens can be understood. So the, the, the protocol they chose was uh, n steps where this middle state was missing. 
followed by another n steps where this middle coupling was present. And just by writing down the tensor network and applying the Hadamard and unitary conditions, it's possible to snip it away and snip it away and understand why the, how this rainbow state uh, arises. So although this was discovered by a method that I'm not really entirely clear, from the graphical point of view, it's extremely simple to understand how, uh, how this dynamics arise. Um, okay, good. I think that's, uh, there's, there's, there are plenty more results on these models in the paper. In particular, the two things I'll highlight were for the circuits of this form that I've just introduced, we have a construction of solitons or gliders in general, although it's not complete, except for the, the case that I already told you about, this Fourier case. Uh, and also some discussion of the, uh, how the theoretical Young-Baxter equation is satisfied by these uh, systems for Q less than six, curiously enough, but not necessarily for Q greater than or equal to six. Uh, but there are more details in the paper. Okay, thank you. Isn't it often the way Gaussian direct is motivated is to calculate correlation functions? Mm -hmm. both correlation yeah. So I wonder here you didn't seem to use that. Sure. Yeah, yes. So so why is the duality relevant? How can I see explicitly why the duality is important for this result? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, so from the point I, I, I guess it's dual unitarity sort of plus plus. <coughs> so in, in the sense that there are, for example, this discussion of entanglement. Um we, we were looking we, we were looking at a case where you have this cellular automata dynamics. And a, a generic cellular automaton would not have a light cone which was at 45 degrees necessarily. Um, if you had some random update rule, then it would in general lie less than that. And therefore, if you the same construction would then give you a um, a entanglement growth which was less than maximal. So, in the, in the sense it appeared, you know, the way in which it appeared there was that the um, that cellular automata was. Uh, Classically, you might say it was space-time dual in the sense that the update rule can either be written as a bijection this way or this way. If that, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, so, so the, the, the correlation functions do also have certain properties, but maybe I can tell you about them. Mm. I have a quick question. So, uh, you know, of course, there's a fine tuning models, but among them, what is the average Kind of typical cases is this fractal dynamics and well that, that is already fine i mean so the the, the, the typical case would be non-clifford chaotic right so mm -hmm. the, uh, an example of so then it's an example of what we know about dual unitarity so far you can compute the correlation functions on the light cone and this kind of thing um the cases that i sort of mentioned were fine-tuned in various ways like you know, they were fine-tuned to be clifford um mm -hmm. in, in one case um, and then by further fine tuning, you can get these kind of sol mm -hmm. solitons. So there's kind of this, 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 uh, they, they were, both the cases I highlighted were special cases of the same general construction. So even with, even with this family of Hadamards, you can have this, all, all kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe another question to this uh, behavior. Does it, is there any chance that some of it survives uh, deterioration sort of Hamiltonian? Uh, you know, appears in the Hamiltonian dynamics, right? Again, if I try to detrotherize it, oh, think about continuous evolution. That's a very, you know, that's very, very big step, of course, right? Yes. But is there a chance that whatever, like you can build models, Hamiltonian models of soliton from this, or well, Hamiltonian models with some of this physics? So real, conti real continuous. Yes, time. real continuous. Yes. Um, I am not not within this not within this class, but you'd have to use this generalized uh, Julian chart that people have been studying lately. Mm -hmm. Which could, because the point there is you can go all the way to the identity matrix with, or the trotter limit. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so this one's a very. So you need yeah yeah but you need a construction like this which worked in that case. Mm -hmm. 